We do have a uh, Commissioner Parsons in the room with us, Ricky. So it looks like we have Courtney. Wonderful. Hello, everybody. The uh, the attachment from the meeting is my Gmail is having trouble with, so I'm trying to figure out a better way to open it. I haven't tried to open it on my computer yet, so give me a quick second while I open up the uh, packet. I can share screen as well. That might be the thing. Maybe. There it is. Cool, thank you. All right, well, as it is four o'clock and as we do have a quorum, let's go ahead and get things rolling. Um, I do have to leave a little bit early today again. Uh, um, so we'll wanna make sure we can get through everything uh, before that happens. Let's uh, do a quick roll call. Uh, uh, I'm here, uh, Commissioner Conway, uh, Commissioner Parsons, Co-Chair Parsons. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Kerr. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Martin. Commissioner Rowden. Present. Hello, Commissioner Rowden. Commissioner Stackhouse. Here. Hello, Commissioner Stackhouse and Commissioner Layden. I think she is coming right now. If you could maybe call that one again. Okay, uh, Commissioner Layden. I'm here. Hello, welcome. All right. Uh, well, that's our attendance. We're rolling on to approval of the minutes uh, that were sent out. And again, my. I looked at them earlier in the uh, when they were sent out, but I can't bring them up right now. Um, but uh, if you've had an opportunity to review those minutes, let's go ahead and talk about approving those minutes. I'll present a motion to approve. Okay, we've got a motion to approve the minutes by Commissioner Parsons. Uh, anybody want to second that? I'll second. Sounds like we got a, a second from Commissioner Stackhouse. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 And aye. Approve, opposed. Super duper. Okay, this is the public participation part of the meeting. I know I'm just going to read this verbatim as I usually do. This portion of the meeting is for items that are not on the agenda. The commission cannot act on items presented during this public participation part of the agenda. We are prohibited by the open meeting law from discussing or considering the item until the item is officially placed on an agenda. And if you do have a comment, we do ask that those are limited to five minutes. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to uh, participate in this here meeting? All right, easy enough. We get to cruise on through to our discussion items. And it looks like we have a discussion today with Martin Ince, the multimodal planner about renaming Sheep's Crossing Foots Tunnel segment to Cosmic Ray Tunnel. And I turn it over to Mr. Ince or to uh, uh, Rebecca, Miss Sayers, if uh, whoever wants to introduce us. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Hang on. <laughs> okay. I to do too many things on tiny laptop. Um, and an inning, Mr. Fire. Okay. So welcome uh, to Martin Ince. And he has been working with several commissions on the possibility of naming um, a segment of a foot's trail or a infrastructure piece of a foot's trail in honor of Cosmic Ray, who passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, he's been working with a citizen group on this, and I believe some of them are here. Um, so I'll just turn it over to Martin. And I'm guessing you'd like me to share <laughs> your presentation, which I just a little bit of panic because uh, I don't have it ready to go. So um, hang on. So go ahead. You can go ahead and talk, and I'll, I'll get it up. All right. Uh, 
Chair Conway, members of the commission, thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Timmins. I'm the multimodal transportation planner for the city. And the item before you tonight is, as um, Rebecca mentioned, is naming a tunnel along the Sheep Crossing Footstep Trail in honor and memory of Costa Gray. Uh, the city has a, has a fairly well defined process for naming and renaming city facilities. And it is outlined in a uh, resolution adopted by the city, I believe, in 2010. And if you could, if you could forward to the next slide. Uh, there it is. So actually, it's, it's a, a resolution 2001-73, so it was adopted back in 2001. Uh, we've been this, through this a few times before with foot trails. I gave a few examples there, the Karen Cooper Trail, the Nate Avery Trail, and the Matt Kelly Bridge. And I think Parks and Recreation has been through it a number of times as well with the new parks and park facilities and, and, and tennis courts. And tennis courts, too. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, here's a quick outline of the process that we follow. Uh, typically, a request is received from somebody in the public. These, these uh, requests are, are generally not initiated by the city or city staff, but by members of the public. Uh, they're, Required to submit a, a request to the city manager uh, and include some information about the request, including the justification. Uh, the request is reviewed by appropriate city commissions. Uh, that's why we're here tonight. Uh, you'll forward a recommendation to the city council who makes the final decision. And then all along the process, we try to engage the public as, as much as we can uh, to let them have a say in, the, in the consideration as well. Uh, so I mentioned that it goes to appropriate city commissions. In the case of foot trails, we go to these commissions. Uh, Parks and Recreation is tonight. Um, the week before last, we went to Transportation Commission. Uh, Transportation Commission has two subcommittees or uh, advisory committees, I should say, pedestrian and bicycle. So you can see the schedule there. They have all recommended approval of, of the request. After this commission, we'll forward it to the city council. That will be sometime in January or maybe February. We don't have, uh, we have not reserved a, a date for that. Yet. A bit on community outreach. Uh, the, the two members of the public who organized the request have collected a petition with 150 signatures. Uh, we at the city have also opened a public community survey on the Flagstaff Community Forum. Uh, we received 362 responses to that survey. It was, it was really a simple survey that just essentially asked people, are you in favor of the naming proposal or are you not in favor of it? And then we gave them space to, to provide comments. Uh, overwhelming amount, 92.5% uh, were in favor. Of the 7.5% that uh, were not in favor, some of the common concerns, or really the, the two main concerns were uh, they thought that a different facility ought to be named for Cosmic Ray, uh, like a trail. Um, and the other concern was uh, because the tunnel does have uh, history in the sheet printing industry in, in Arizona, that that history ought to be uh, maintained and respected. And I, I, think that, I think that second point is, is worth talking about for just a moment. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a couple slides coming up uh, about this tunnel and the, and the trail that goes through it, uh, but in essence, it was built in 1960 when uh, Interstate 17 was built, and the tunnel was really a way for sheep to get across the interstate uh, safely from uh, east side where there is uh, a historic or an old ranch that was used by a sheep herding family for many years uh, to get from that east side to the west side. Once they get to the west side, they can move between their summer and winter uh, pastures. And these are these are not small movements that uh, the sheep travel like from Yuma from here all the way down to Yuma you know, twice a year, uh, and often the herds were uh, ten thousand or more sheep. And these are big herds of sheep, so you can imagine the issues with moving a herd of sheep that big across an active interstate. <laughs> um, so they built the tunnel, and um, that's its history, and that really goes kind of touches on the history of Flagstaff and. The, Ask Heritage and Flagstaff and the, the sheep herding history of uh, Arizona. Um, 
I, th I think that's that's worth acknowledging. Um, we named that trail the Sheep Crossing Trail for that reason. Um, we've been talking internally with other city staff about um, how to acknowledge and, and sort of pass that information along about sheep in the street so people understand why that tunnel is there to make that link to, to flight staff and, and that part of our history. Uh, so we can, we can go on to the next slide. Um, in that resolution, the criteria adopted by the city, uh, when things are named in, in memory or in honor of an individual here, the criteria that must be met. Uh, I will point out the fourth one bullet point is that the person must have been deceased for a minimum of two years and that condition is, is met in this case. Next slide, please. A little bit about Cosmic Ray. Uh, his given name was Raymond J. Bruni. He was born in 1946, but came to Flagstaff at age 33 in 1979. Uh, he originally worked as a mechanic at the original Cosmic Cycles on uh, San Francisco. And sometime around then, he adopted his moniker by which most of us knew him, which was Cosmic Gray. In 1988, he published a, a guide to mountain biking in Flagstaff that was followed up by uh, hiking guides for uh, Flagstaff and Arizona more generally. And he died uh, in October of 2020 at the age of 74. Next slide. <clears throat> now, in reviewing the information that was submitted, uh, against the criteria set forth in the resolution. Uh, this, what we believe, are, is a justification for considering the naming. Uh, Ray's work that I mentioned before was published in 1988. Uh, keep in mind that at that time, mountain biking was a fairly new activity, and the book really helped put Flagstaff on the, on the map in terms of outdoor recreation, outdoor activity, uh, both hiking and biking. Uh, his guidebooks remain popular today. Um, I would imagine a lot of a lot of us have one version or another sitting on our shelves. Someplace I, I know my, my experience is not uncommon when we moved to that was one of the first books we got to help us to figure out where to hike and, and go mountain biking. Uh, last bullet point, uh, Ray did also promote biking and flight staff in other ways, um, including a number of repair clinics and maintenance clinics, uh, helping people find bikes for basic transportation and um, helping do some cleaning on our Trails and city streets. And so, again, that's, that's what, I, what we staff recommend um, in terms of the justification for the naming uh, when compared to the criteria that supports the resolution. Next slide. Uh, a bit about the Sheep Crossing Foots Trail. It's a little under a mile in length. We completed it in late 2020. Uh, it essentially connects from the Ponderosa Trails neighborhood or the south of the Ponderosa Trails neighborhood on the east side of I-17 to Fort Tuthill on the west side. And in that way, serves a valuable function in allowing people to walk or, or bike to get to Fort Tuthill for recreation or events. Uh, I mentioned the, the, the tunnel, and this is this is really just naming the tunnel for Cosmic Ray, the remainder of the trail, it's really called Sheep Crossing. Uh, there are two concrete boxes that were built in 1960. Each one is 10 feet by 10 feet in dimension. Um, we are using the southern box for the trail, and the northern box remains kind of you know, unfinished. It's original state and um, serves a function for natural drainage. Next slide. And here's a, a map of the trail and the tunnel, uh, the, kind of the collection of gray lines running north and south through the middle of the map is I-17. The neighborhood in the upper right hand corner is Ponderosa Trails, and the big green square in the lower left is Fort Tuthill. And then the next slide, you show a couple of images of, uh, of the tunnel. Um, here it is. This is uh, after it was completed, but uh, before the, the planting around it had started to grow up. You can see that we connected the, the tunnel with the trail, and then you can kind of see uh, in between the two wing walls. The two 10 by 10 concrete boxes. And then one last image is the approach in the other direction. Um, you can see it's hard to see into the tunnel, but it is lit. Uh, the, the lighting actually um, is variable depending on the time of the day. Uh, so at night, it'll be a little bit less bright than it is during the day. And then I think there's one more slide. 
Um, so really what's before you tonight is just the process of naming the tunnel for Cosmic Ray. Uh, the organizers are considering a uh, memorial, which may take the form of a, of a plaque or a mural, one of the wing walls or the walls of the tunnel uh, or a bench or something in, uh, of that nature. Uh, that's a separate process from the naming that's before you tonight, but we are moving forward with that. Uh, that is described in a different resolution. Uh, I've got a list of here, 2014-18. And depending on the, the scale or the nature of that memorial, it may uh, it will involve Parks and Rec uh, staff, and it may or may not involve the commission. And I believe that is the a, a conclusion of, of my information. I'm happy to answer any questions. I, I will note that uh, Tao Mellis, who is one of the Organizers of this request is in the room. Um, do you know if it's Kayon or Martin? I was communicating with her. She was going to try to join us. Martin, but okay. I'm thinking that she's on the yeah, So, so Kay, Kay Pfeiffer was the other was the other organizer. Uh, with the commission's indulgence, I would I would ask um, if you might hear from Tao and Kay if she's available a little bit more about their request and Cosmic Ray. Okay. Well, again, uh, I'm Teo Mellis. I live at 112 North Aztec Street, uh, downtown Flagstaff. Been a resident of Flagstaff since 1981 and uh, had the pleasure of calling Ray my friend since about 1982, so we went back quite a ways. And uh, he died on October 2nd, 2020, as Martin mentioned. And it was two weeks after he had taken an unfortunate fall, very close to where we're at right now, under the 4th Street Bridge. Ray usually went out of his way to ride underneath the bridge on the part of the foot trail there. And he hated litter. He just couldn't understand, like, why, why, do, why do people litter? So one day, I wasn't with him that day, but he, he went under there and he was picking up trash, which people leave there. And he slipped and he fell and he had some contusions, his elbows and shoulders hit. Nothing broken, but, you know, he was bloodied. Showed me the wounds the next day. Two weeks later to the day, he was dead from uh, blood poisoning, sepsis, septicemia. It shocked the community, shocked his family. I'm sure Ray had no idea it would lead to anything like that. Um, before that happened, during the summer of 2020, Ray and I would ride around the city almost every day, go out for coffee and stuff. Um, we'd ride out to the airport a lot, Swift, Fort Tuggill, and we saw that the city was improving this segment of the Sheep Crossing Trail. And we knew about the tunnel because we'd been around there and ridden our mountain bikes through there years and years ago when it was all full of debris. It wasn't really nice. And it was it was being innovated and fixed up. Ah, French drain, lighting. But we didn't have a chance to ride through it, of course, because it was still under construction. And um, Ray died on October 2nd. And a month later, when it was opened by the city for use, I rode through there. Ray was kind of a kid when he was on his bike. I mean, he was 74 years old, but he'd still like to ride through the smaller tunnels in town over near his house. And, you know, shout and make noise, ring his bell, and get on a bike, basically, at 74 years old, he was still enjoying it. And I rode through the tunnel, and I thought of my friend Ray, and I said, well, you know, I wonder if there's really a, a naming process, and this would be a great feature. It's part of the Foots Trail. It's a major innovation, improvement, takes people without having to go around the roundabouts into Fort Tuggill, hiking, mountain biking. And so uh, the day after he died, Kay, my friend Kay was up here from Prescott, and she said, I think we should try to you know, do something to honor Ray's memory. And I just threw out the idea of the tunnel, which I just ridden through, um, not even at that time, it was basically a month later when I actually rode through it. So we began this um, effort and it's turned into, like Martin was saying, the naming is officially what we're trying to get through right now. But um, we're hoping if we can get the funding, we've already worked with some mural artists here in town to add some art to the tunnel and make it more of an attraction besides just the transportation corridor actually brightened up with some muraling that hopefully would include many aspects of Ray's life and his hobbies, but also the shepherds, the vast shepherding history here. And um, so that's in, pro in progress. Kay, who unfortunately couldn't be with us here online, uh, has met with the Beautification Commission last spring, and I think she's preparing another proposal this year. Now we have um, Two artists, at least, who are interested in participating. 
They're doing some concept sketches for what the art might be, and uh, we'll try to get whatever funds are available through the through the process that's available through the city, and perhaps try to raise some other funds on the outside as we can. And so the first idea on that, once once we're able to say that it's actually beneficially made, if that's what happens, then we'll start moving forward on phase two, which is beautification and the new art. So um, I brought in a few photographs. Um, Ray was, you know, usually, if you knew Ray, he was either on his bike or next to his bike, often at Macy's Coffee House, drinking coffee. And, and he was a bit of a community celebrity. I mean, he, he was just promoting human power transportation, and he was a good guy. And the tunnel, I think, turned out exceptionally well because the lighting, once you're inside the tunnel, the lighting is, is quite remarkable. You can see the gray walls are just like, it's like a blank canvas waiting for somebody to come along with some ideas. So that's that's about all I have to say. I just uh, hope you'll be able to support the proposal. It was really Kay's proposal. We had a memorial for Ray about a year after he died. People came out of the woodwork. We easily got 150 signatures, people supporting the idea. And in, in terms of the comment about like naming some other feature in town after Ray, um, the reason we kind of settled on the tunnel is because it has this great muraling potential, you think. And um, as I've spent some time out there photographing it, talking to people, especially people with small children, they really think it's a great improvement, right? They don't have to take their kids in the street to get into a major park, the largest park in the county. And uh, dressing it up with some mural art, uh, perhaps by more than just one artist, is something that we think would be not only befitting in the sheep herding history, but also Ray. And uh, hopefully we keep the graffiti here as well. So thank you. Well, thank you guys very much. Um, great presentation. Uh, I had two questions. One of them was already answered, uh, why that section of trail or that tunnel and it's a mural potential. My other one would, I just want to clarify, would it be the sheep crossing trail and then the cosmic ray tunnel? Or is it all going to be one one name? Because right now it's all one name, right? Sheep, it's both the sheep crossing trail and tunnel. Uh, yes, Chair, Chair Conway, the first one. So the sheep crossing trail, and the Cosmic Ray Tunnel. Perfect. Okay. That was, that was my clarification. Any uh, other commissioners I would like to open up for your guys' questions, comments, thoughts? Um, if you have any, uh, please go ahead and raise your hand. There you go, Commissioner Parsons. Yeah. Um, the concerns that that 7% raise are kind of a concern of mine, too. I don't want to lose the history. And I understand from this gentleman's point about you know, the, the ability to put Murals and artwork, you know, that's a good valid point, I think. So I just want to make sure because the, the purpose of that tunnel initially was to move the sheep, right? So I think we need to hold on to that history somehow. And I'm not sure if the trail which is being named that is sheep crossing is fine. I would like to see that flip flopped and allow for the artwork to. To still be included within the the, the trail it's, or the tunnel itself, even if that will be named. So, I mean, my preference would be uh, name the trail Cosmic Ray and the tunnel to the sheep's crossing, but allow for that potential artwork within the tunnel to occur. But that's just my two cents. I can support it either way. So. I, I would just add, you know, we've talked to Ernie earlier about how, how to um, you know, provide the information on the history. I, I think artwork is is one form. There's also you know, interpretive signs and plaques, or things that actually provides mm -hmm. some information on the like, Yeah, what it did. Or so maybe there's even on. part of that artwork that's included is not only just cosmic ray, but it is. It's maybe something having to do with the, the sheep crossing in history. Maybe Ray's chasing a bunch of sheep on the bike. <laughs> well, there's, there's, there's been some lack of discussions about concepts. And was, and Ray, Ray and I toured together in Europe and encountered herds of sheep at various points in time. And he was, it's just intriguing. And the animals uh, surrounding you when you're on a bicycle with the dogs barking. Shepherd kind of looking at who are you guys and we really I mean, shared that experience. Ray and I never talked about the tunnel and its sheep history. I'm not even sure that he knew the history. But um, 
I can't speak for him, he's no longer here, yeah. but I don't think he would have any problems with the sheep crossing his street and the fast community which work on shepherding. I think he was very much aware of and yeah. supportive of my man in the same thing was last year on the government. <laughs> a short story, his his bicycle that he named Brutus because his name is Ray Bruby was uh, hand built by Steve Garrow. I don't know if you know Steve Garrow, Coconino Cycles. Uh, Steve's unfortunately paralyzed now. He, he works from a wheelchair, but uh, he comes from a vast family. And so there's even that kind of weird connection with his bike. Great, uh, great comment, Commissioner Parsons. Um, you know, and, and to that same, in that same vein, you know, would, is there a way that we would be able to kind of stip state or, I don't know, stipulate the state, you know, we would like to see interpretive signs uh, showcasing the history of Sheep Hill Tunnel um, as part of that future development were this to go forward. I think, I think that's a great uh, piece of business right there to make sure that we, we do something and we, you know, we, we kind of make that clear that that would be a, a benefit or a, a good way to tie everything in. Um, I think that's a great comment, Commissioner Parsons. Any other uh, commissioners want to uh, have any comments, questions, thoughts? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Um, I am also in support of this uh, this initiative. Um, I think it's it's wonderful. Um, it checks all the it. it uh, Checks all the boxes, um, making sure that uh, we are complying with uh, uh, city policy. Ooh, I got a message in here. No questions, but thank you, speakers. And then I popped away. Oh, for the history. Yes. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Rowden. Uh, she doesn't have any questions, but wants to thank uh, you guys for um, your presentation today. Um, so I guess this would be an opportunity to. Uh, Put out a, a vote um, and just you know get the other commissioners um, on whether we support the renaming Sheep's Crossing Foots Tunnel segment to the Cosmic Ray Tunnel. And I will add in there with a small caveat that we would love to see interpretive panels as part of any future uh, design inside that tunnel to showcase history. And I do like that it's still going to be called the Sheep Crossing Trail, so we'll still have the trail, um, uh, and that, that helps complement things. So. Um, with that, or, or with any other uh, items you might want to attend uh, to that, uh, does anybody, other commissioners, want to put forth uh, approval or uh, vote? All, all in favor? All right. Um, all right, got a motion from Parsons. All second. Second from Sackhouse. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or any other discussion? Hearing none, it sounds the commission is in favor of this as were your other, uh, we're, we're in line with your other presentations and the other hoops you've had to jump through. You guys have done uh, your homework and your due diligence and I think this would be a great way to honor somebody uh, very uh, instrumental in, in mountain biking in this community. And so uh, you, have our, you have our blessings. I'd just like to acknowledge Martin's role in this and thank him because he's he's literally been shepherding this through now the fourth <laughs> and uh, hopefully we'll meet up again at the city council meeting in the future. Thank you, folks. Thank you very much and thank you, Martin. Really appreciate your time today. I'd probably encourage you to get in front of the VPAC as soon as possible, too, in regards to the um, the part of their proposed murals and all that, and see if there's any as well as you can do this. I'm not familiar with the term. It's a uh, Unification and Public Art Commission. Oh, yes. Uh, Kate's, in, Kate's formerly worked with Eliza before she left. Mm -hmm. So she's she's in the process of developing a more detailed proposal with the budget for this round in 23. Let's uh, move on to a uh, discussion on the Francis Short Pond dredging maintenance. Uh, from Mr. Ed Schenk. Schenk, Schenk yep. Stormwater manager. Got it. Thanks for joining us. Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm ready, Rebecca. Uh, thank you. So, uh, Ed Schenk, I'm the stormwater manager here at City of Flagstaff. Uh, here today with an informational item, uh, also for discussion. 
uh, <clears throat> French short pond and the need for the, the dredging of the pond. Um, quick overview, pond was completed in 1923, well, the dam was completed in 1923, obviously pond came with that um, as a flood control structure for the downtown and as part of the park. Uh, it was largely abandoned shortly after that and infilled with sediment until the 1970s when it was reimagined as a pond amenity and outdoor uh, educational, uh, environmental educational classroom. Um, we've had two significant dredgings in the recent past, 2008 and 2015, or 17. Maybe you might remember better than I do, Rebecca. <clears throat> it was either 15 or 17. Uh, and then obviously it's been impacted uh, this last year by that pipeline fire. So Schultz Creek draining into the Rio flag, uh, flowing through Thorpe Park and, and through the pond as well. Um, some of the same results here. There we go, it's a little bit of a lag. Um, some of that same history here, just with a little bit more detail. Um, so the property was purchased in 1922 to Clark Ranch. Uh, that was created as the park shortly after that. Um, and then you kind of work through here. So a little bit of history before the 70s, and then in the 70s, that's when it really kind of uh, recreated, if, if you will, as that pond that we have seen uh, today. And then also a picture of that pond looking from the south towards the north uh, from uh, partway through it. So it is a, a small pond with an island feature in there. Um, it is maintained for fish by the Arizona Game and Fish Department. Uh, they stock it with sports fish. Uh, the city does maintain it uh, or help maintain it for that habitat by a series of aerators to keep the solid oxygen up, um, as well as uh, reclaim water when needed to keep the water level up, um, and then uh, regular bathymetric surveys uh, to make sure that the pod configuration um, is similar to what it's been designed for in the past. Um, we did have a bathymetric survey last year in 2021 by Natural Channel Design. Uh, the reason for that was that there was a rather large flood event uh, in the Rio de Flag, um, one of the sub-tributaries up near Chimney Springs, so about a three to four hundred year rain event that did cause some uh, flooding in the Rio de Flag. It also caused a fish kill in the pond. Uh, we did not see significant sedimentation from that event in the pond. Uh, we did order a new survey this year just due to the fire and flood events off of Schultz Creek um, with the expectation of finding significant sedimentation uh, due to the fact that the pond is in line with the Rio flag, which means that all the flood waters that comes down through the Rio have to move through the pond and then back out into the Rio again on the other side, which means that you're going to have some substantial significant I can't talk. Some sedimentation just due to that change in velocity as you reach the pond. Uh, we did actively manage the pond through the year. Um, what I mean by that is we drained it uh, two to three feet between events to allow for um, uh, some detention of those flood flows before it reached downtown and south side. And that did seem to, to provide some protection to both the downtown and the south side. Um, uh, we have five flood events. Um, Pretty much an instant fish kill off the first flood event just due to the ash that are being brought in. So since that first flood event, we, we do not have no uh, sports fish in the pond. Arizona Game Fish has suspended any new stocking until um, we can show that that watershed is recovered in some way. Uh, so we did have that bathymetric survey completed this year in November by Natural Channel Design. Um, won't spend too much time on this, but this is looking at um, the flood, or no, sorry, the pond volume uh, by elevation, you know, water volume, uh, water elevation in the pond. Um, kind of the quick story here is that we lost roughly 19, 20% of the volume of the pond in these five events. Uh, to show that more graphically, um, this is the RTK surveys, the real time kinetic GPS survey we have of the pond from 2000. 21 on the right, so pre fire, and then our um, survey from November on the left. Kind of hard to see here in the room and the screen, uh, but the darker red is a deeper depth, and the, the, sh the lighter colors in orange and green is a, is a shallower depth. And what you're seeing is about four to five feet of sedimentation in the deeper part of that pond. So the part that's closer to the school, the Flagstaff Junior Academy. 
uh, saw about five feet of sedimentation through there. If you go out right now, you can kind of get that sense. You can look in the pond, it's very murky. There's a lot of ash in there. There's a lot of fine sediment. Um, it just doesn't really look all that pretty, despite the fact that it has water in it. Um, so kind of an issue that we see there because um, right now, if you do nothing, that's always an option. Um, it will not be suitable for fish. Uh, and that's just due to the ash content, the amount of nutrients that are put in, fine sediment. Uh, and we've also lost that volume, so roughly 20% of the volume of the pond. Um, so any flood mitigation that we try to do for the next year, um, we reduce them that amount uh, within it. Uh, our other option is to dredge the pond. Um, it will be relatively costly. We're looking at about 30,000 cubic yards of sediment. Um, so a fair amount of sediment that we have to move out of the pond itself. Um, that will be partly covered um, this year by disaster recovery funds through the Department of Emergency and Military Affairs at the state level. And that's because we did have state declarations, state uh, disaster declarations due to the flood events. Um, so this will be partly covered by that. Um, it would be work that would be covered um, using an outside contractor and not internal resources just due to the lack of uh, internal staff resources for something like this. Um, so things to note, um, to do this we will have to drain the pond completely, which will be a bit of an eyesore. And also if it's not in the winter, possible odor concerns, um, not just due to the ash and debris, but whatever leftover fish there might be in there, which at the moment would probably be, um, trying to think of a polite term to use it, but um, trashy fish, you know, that you're talking your carp, your bottom feeders, the ones that can really live through the poor water quality conditions we have right now. Um, but there will be both an eyesore and other condition um, as we allow that to drain and dry enough that we can bring heavy equipment in, which will probably take uh, two to three months. So there will be a period for the historic park where there'll be an impact um, to anybody that's in that area. Uh, now, once that's dredged, it will provide obviously that flood mitigation that we saw this year where we can kind of change the lake level as we need um, to, to prevent downstream flooding. Um, there's also the possibility of fishery reduction because uh, even if we do see floods in the future, uh, it should be much cleaner water. The reason for that is we have the Schultz Basins, we have the three basins upstream uh, off the Elden Lookout Road that should be trapping most of the sediment, ash, and debris uh, instead of having that come down through Coconino States and, and reach the pond. So it should be cleaner water, cleaner flood water. I'm not going to say clean, but cleaner and uh, reduce the need for future dredging. Um, further considerations, um, so the city does have a draft operation and maintenance manual for the pond uh, that was uh, developed uh, by the stormwater section with some consultation with parks and recreation pros. Uh, it's not complete at the moment, and that's due to the fact that we still have some staff concern about long-term funding for operation and maintenance um, and the roles and responsibilities. So not just the funding, but then which staff uh, should be in charge of different parts of, of that pond maintenance, whether it's amenity, fish, stormwater conveyance, etc. Lots of different uh, people that are involved with this. So we're still working on that on that manual. Uh, another consideration, the Rio de Flag Flight Control Project, Army Corps project, uh, does include the pond as part of the overall project. So the city will need to maintain this pond in the future per that final project design and agreement with the Army um, and then we'll, one last one that I have here, uh, the pond has been stocked by game fish for, for quite a while now, I'm not sure how many years. Um, and this has really been a great partnership between the city and game fish and something that's been valued in the past, and probably something that we'll want to continue in the future. So just one more consideration, of, uh, you know, as we move forward, to make sure that we have them on board as a partner. That was kind of like really quick and dirty. <laughs> what I have to do. Well, we'll be dirty. We'll definitely be dirty when we're out there. Uh, but just kind of bringing this to the commission today. Um, as I mentioned, one, informational, so it doesn't catch you off guard. Uh, but then two, also open for discussion. Um, we do not have a contractor on board yet. Um, there's a lot of moving parts with this. Uh, very much open for uh, comments, concerns, suggestions, uh, anything else uh, that we can take internally and, and help. Uh, move this project forward. 
Awesome. Thank you very much for that uh, presentation. I myself love Francis Shore Pond. Uh, back when I first got to this uh, Copio County, we did a free fishing day out there. Uh, that was a lot of fun and promoting with game and fish and the city of Flagstaff promoting, you know, uh, fishing and, and creating the license. And um, we take our summer camp group out there. So I, I mean, I, I, it's a very value, highly valued by the community and by those of us, you know, doing things with the youth, we love uh, having those opportunities, uh, especially because it has been stocked by Game of Fish in the past. So I know it's a very valuable asset to the community. Um, so with that, I will open up to other commissioners first um, for comments, questions, uh, and and once again, thank you so so much for bringing this to us. Um, anybody want to start off, Commissioner Parsons? Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned it's not fully funded at this point. It'll at least be partially funded by DEMA disaster recovery. Anything that's required above and beyond that will have to come out of the stormwater fund. Okay. Since it is a, a flood issue. And the timing for it would be what, this upcoming spring? Or something? I would really like to get it going this winter while we still have um, low temperatures. Yeah. And that's mostly for two reasons. One, if we can have frozen ground out there, it's a lot easier to move equipment on if we can get that grain. Uh, but the bigger one is odor control, right? Uh, so if we can keep it down 30 degrees, less than that, you won't have that problem. If it's late spring and we have those high winds and it's 70 degrees out, it's strong. Uh, it's, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, um, yeah, as you all know. Yeah. So um, <laughs> we definitely want to reduce the impact to the to neighbors. Yeah. And then um, what else? What other impacts? I mean, are there other um, environmental impacts to that. Um, there's other species, you know, I know there's fowl that, that are supported by that. Um, um, maybe some other amphibious uh, creatures or anything like that. Is it, is it even a designated weapons or, or do they, what do they consider that? Um, to my knowledge, it's not a designated wetlands uh, because it is maintained artificially by reclaimed water. Um, but in the amount of amphibians you have to Great question. I mean, I know there are turtles in there. I'm sure there's frogs, toads. I've never seen salamanders. They tend to be a lot more sensitive to water quality. Um, what assurances do you think that you know those aren't destroyed and then you have to re bring those back? Or yeah, I mean, I'm sure. I don't think we can get any assurances. We can definitely try to do like a volunteer day or days to like, especially as we start bringing it down. You know, mm -hmm. get out there and. and I don't want to say rescue, but you know, essentially rescue what we find out there. Um, where that would go, I'm not quite sure. If you can maybe go to the Rio wetlands, you know, relocation and some of that, uh, that probably make the most sense. Um, and then, yeah, it would probably have to be restocked, to be honest. Because I don't think we can just let those out in a different wetland and somehow capture them and bring them back in. Right. Probably have to be restocked. Yeah. The existing, are there existing fish still in there? I think there's still something in there. <laughs> you see stuff flopping around, but uh, I doubt there's any sport fish. My guess is probably, you know, carp. There might be a handful of small catfish, maybe. But I know when we had a fish kill last year, even catfish, which are pretty hardy, um, you yeah. know, a lot of them died. So that's which I was kind of surprised because they can live extremely low DO. How how much do you expect to take out? I mean. You mentioned a cubic yard, but in terms of like a depth and feet, it's just going to be, I mean, you got five foot of sediment in there now. I assume you want to go lower. We want to get to, to back it. So in 2005, part of a grant, I forget which grant it was, um, they did actually dredge it and then they did an as built survey. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're basing as our baseline. So we want to bring it back to that 2005 quality. And is there a treatment once you do dredge it? I mean, or is it, or do you just fill it back up with water? Or? I mean, in the past, there was a clay lining in it, and I think we want to make sure that clay lining is still intact so that we don't have a lake lean kind of issue. Um, uh, but beyond that, in terms of water treatment, like, no, we'll probably refill with, I mean, my thought is refill it partially, reclaim it if you did by the end of. Winter, you can allow some natural recharge through whether it's spring, assuming it gets snow, um, whether it's spring runoff we have, so you can get some natural water in there as well. Yeah, no, I'm wondering about the clay liner or any other thing to stabilize. So. No, that was it.
Thank you, Commissioner Parsons. Uh, anyone else? I think I saw Commissioner Stackhouse maybe unmute for a moment. Yeah. Um, so with with the other fire that happened on the other side of town, I know they built a bunch of detentions detention basins above it. Um, and I think you touched on this, but what in what are there pretty good assurances that with future flows that you're going to have other places for the sediment to go so that you're not dredging it again or how, like I'm sure you're considering this. I'm just curious how where those are that kind of stuff. Yeah, so the city is able to complete with the help of NRCS uh, three large basins. Um, we call them Schultz Basins uh, up near Eldon Lookout Road. They're fairly large. Um, I actually took out some of the open space, unfortunately. Um, so 16 acres is the, the size of them on a 20 acre parcel, city owned parcel. Um, so that should remove quite a bit of the sediment. Um, so we'll be able to, to essentially dredge it from up there in the future and not in the pond, which would be ideal. Um, it's not going to get rid of all of it. There's, I mean, there still is, you know, the, the pipes that pipe the water back out of those basins. So there will be some sediment transport out of those basins and downstream. But it'll be, and I don't want to give a percentage, but it'll be a much, much smaller percentage than what we saw this year where everything just flowed right through. Um, so our hope is that it'll be trapped in those three basins up near Eldon Lookout Road. And we'll see a much smaller sediment load into the French and short pond. Right, thanks for that. Um, I, I do want the commission to understand that while this is a great amenity um, and it's great to have a wetland as part of Sort Park, it is first and foremost a stormwater feature. Um, and so it needs to function that way. So even without the fires and flooding, there will still be maintenance that's required um, for this to maintain itself as a stormwater feature in the way that it was developed um, and built. So um, certainly this dredging is required because of the sediment coming out from the fires and floods, but it's not like we would never dredge it otherwise. We, we would still have to do that um, over time. Hopefully that helps. Just hopefully not off. Correct. <laughs> Maybe every 20 years yeah. instead of two. What is the projected cost? Uh, we don't have a cost back from the JOCs yet, from the uh, contractors, but my guess, just looking at how much it costs to do a cubic yard, and I'm not talking about taking the landfill, so it's a different cost, but just removing from a basin, which is about $27 a cubic yard. Um, we're probably in the range of, I'm give you a larger range than the one I'm thinking. It's probably between $500,000 and $800,000. But that's just for removal. That's not, if we have to do landfill tipping fees, um, that's about $46, I believe, a cubic yard. So then you're doubling or tripling the cost. That's all we need some filter. Yeah, if you know of anybody, uh, <laughs> we actually are going through that. We're almost complete, by the way, Rebecca, with just went for one, one lab test back. But we did actually send out three samples. So we had a upper, middle, and lower yeah, sample. Yeah, out in Vaderville wants to build a bigger berm. Bigger berm, <laughs> yeah. So we, we, did, we did test the sediment. And so far, we have found nothing uh, toxic or, or in any way negative with it. Tends to be rather silty, but if you know anybody who needs a lot of silt, um, you're gonna have a lot of sediment to get rid of. It's clean. I just don't know if you're gonna do a bunch of silt. You can augment it with sand and build with it or garden with it. And it looks like uh, Commissioner Rowden does not have any questions. And and I guess my question was. This isn't a request for funding. It doesn't. I didn't hear an ask. I didn't hear anything like that. It, so uh, this is more, like you said, just informational. Uh, this is on the. This is coming down the pike at some point, hopefully in the very near future. Um, just kind of giving us a heads up. Is, is that correct? That's correct. I mean, I hope you guys have that kind of money to throw around in the future. But um, yeah, this, this isn't a request by Stormwater by any means. No, just informational. Then, uh, if you had any comments or suggestions, happy to take. 
no, no, no request for funding. It's just it's so it's so unique in our in our in the last few months. I feel like every meeting we've had somebody coming to ask uh, ask for something, uh, you know, looking for a new new facility or new new something or other. So I'm I'm a little thrown back. Uh, this is great. Um, cool. Uh, yeah, I, I, great questions by the other commissioners. I don't have anything to add to that. Um, does anybody else uh, that hasn't had an opportunity to speak? I I do see a hand up. I just don't know what. You know, uh, uh, community participation for something like that. I don't remember. We don't have that happen very often. Um, I get a head nod, so go ahead. Yeah. Well, um, again, Teo Mellis, I live at 112 North Aztec Street, so the pond is just a couple blocks north of me, and it's a great resource, and I'm glad to hear this report. My um, question is would the segment of the Foots Trail that kind of connects the end of Aztec Street and the ball courts to the north, would that be closed during this or would it remain open for use? So that's kind of a main north, north south corridor. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a great question. And, and until we really get a contractor out there to see what equipment they're using, um, I don't think I can answer it right, okay. right away. But yeah, if we do have to close it for the week or wherever it takes them to come in, um, yeah, we'll have to do a reroute. And that was my other question with the length of time. I know you don't know the cost, but that, is it not six months? It's two months. Oh, no, no. It's the actual the time that the equipment in should be relatively short. Okay. So we're going to have to drain the pond for quite a while to allow it to drain, um, to start to settle. But um, that doesn't require any heavy equipment. You know, there's a drain already in there. So we can do that and leave everything open as it's been. Yeah. Okay, you know, thanks. You want those soils to dry out. So. Yeah, because right now it's just pure muck. Yeah. It's so silty and so ashy. Like, yeah, that needs some time to dry, or at least freeze. Yeah. Well, Ed, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, thank you for giving us a heads up on this project. Uh, I am glad to hear that um, you know uh, there are options and that things are being worked on with regard to Francis Short Pond. I you know it's uh, sad to hear the impacts from the uh, from the events that happened. And so, yeah, uh, really happy to hear things are moving forward. And good luck on the project. And let us know uh, if there's anything else that intersects. I, I would also be interested to know about any of those park closures or things, but luckily it will be potentially happening in the winter time where usage is down a little bit more. So hopefully it all aligns properly and, and you guys, it's a painless process. Also, I just can't help but think you're going to find a giant goldfish like we did a free fishing day. The biggest thing caught was a household goldfish that was ginormous. I, I, it was it was incredible. So, I, you know, there are things, crazy things living in that pond. I'm, I'm, sorry, I, I'm kind of excited to see what you guys Post on social media, people go crazy over it. <laughs> Sounds good, thank you. It's like when they used to drain hey, their basements in Phoenix. There's some low points, and they come in with the vacuum and suck up all the fish. Mm -hmm. You just see hundreds, of, I mean, thousands of fish. And all kinds of other stuff. I mean, carp are amazing. They can live through everything. Yeah. Seems like. And the white birds that they put in. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the next part of our business today uh, could be a pretty quick one. Uh, the January and February dates fall okay. on holidays uh, for this commission. Uh, I will tell you right now, I can't make January 9th. Um, you guys are welcome to meet. Uh, I won't I won't be able to be there on that day. Um, we can either try to find a different day. Um, but uh, I won't be able to be there on the 9th. The 13th uh, looks fine for me as well uh, right now. So, um, Rebecca, is there anything you want to front load that, or is that pretty much the gist of it? And we just kind of talk about what dates work. Chair, did you mean the 13th of February? You are able to attend? I am able to attend the February 13th. I cannot attend January 9th. So, in January, I can do the 23rd or the 30th, um, but I can't do the 9th. Again, if, if most people can make it, uh, you're happy. Uh, Co-chair Parsons can go ahead and and um, and and run the meeting. I, I'll be fine uh, missing that one, but I I just can't make the night. Yeah. So the problem is we meet on the third Monday of the month, which in January and February is the 16th and the 20th. The 16th of January is um, Martin Luther. Yeah, Martin Luther King. January and February is President's Day. Uh, if we went to the fourth Monday 
we already have the open spaces commission meeting in this room um, and I usually have to attend those just like yours um, but we could hold if, if that's the preferred date then this uh, the parks and rec commission could be online only we've only got one commissioner here in person today um, anyway so that's that's an option if those dates are better I don't mind sharing the Commissioner Stackhouse, are you good on the ninth? Yeah, I'm good on the ninth. Uh, Commissioner Rowden, Commissioner Layden, are you guys good on the ninth as well? Yes. Yes. I So yeah, it seems if, if if I don't know what you know, uh, I guess we'd need to find out from Kerr if uh, Kerr Martin potentially. But uh, if, you know, if you want to put something out, I'm again, I'm happy uh, to let like, co-chair uh, Parsons uh, rock and roll on the ninth um, instead of trying to swap a, a whole bunch of stuff just for me. Um, and I can make it on the and then just to clear, everybody good on the thirteenth of February. If that one's uh, pretty easy. I'm good on the thirteenth. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so February thirteenth, we're all good with, and and if Kerr Martin can uh, can go to the ninth, uh, then I'd say stick with that, and uh, and if they can't, then maybe we revisit via email on the tw to do it a different day or to just cancel the January one. Yeah, it sounds like we'll be able to have quorum on both of those dates that I suggested. I did want the commission to know I. I've been corresponding with Commissioner Kerr. The reason, um, for those of you who may not know, that he's typically not here is he's in graduate school, and his classes are on Mondays, for, at least for the fall semester. He let me know today that he will also have classes on Mondays in the spring, but it's not every Monday, so it will depend on how his class falls and how our meetings fall. So I'll let him know these dates and hopefully he can start attending again. He has been keeping up to speed by watching the videos and reviewing the minutes um, and then letting me know if he has any questions or comments, which there haven't been any. Um, and Commissioner Martin just had family commitments today with the holiday coming up, so that's why he's not here. Okay. Commissioner right. on the independent film study uh, part of the commission. He's, he's got to do it all by himself. Um, so we'll move forward with the 9th and the 13th of January and February, respectively. Excellent. Thank you very oh. much. And good forethought and looking ahead of things, too. Thank you. We will get, well, this happens every year. <laughs> so it might be something that. Um, we just plan for in the future and we can even put that on our website that in January and February we'll meet on the second Mondays instead of the third. Um, and what was I going to say? Oh, we will get uh, meeting appointments out to you for your calendars since those are a little different. We'll go ahead and get those out and I'm looking at Beck and Corinne who we've not been able to introduce yet. Um, we have a new administrative specialist that you will start receiving emails and appointments from. Her name is Corinne Brown, and she is over here if you want to make progress. <laughs> Just looking at our video, I can see Rebecca all the way to Commissioner Parsons. I can't see anybody on the other side of Parsons. <laughs> you know, they set up the camera, so I think they did that on purpose. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, Amy, it looks like you're on for a Thorpe Park Annex update, talking about the final concept. All right, thank you. If you all are okay, I think you've got enough time, so I'll go through the presentation that was last provided to City Council a couple weeks ago. So it's, it was our last time to approach City Council regarding Thorpe Park Annex and this final concept for adoption um, for this group in case there's any 
of our newer commissioners that aren't that familiar with Thor Park. It is a regional park. It's approximately 219 acres with about 130 acres that we would consider more active recreation. So things like the tennis courts, softball fields, disc golf course, playgrounds, basketball courts, little league fields, a multi-purpose field, the urban trail system that runs through there, and a recreation center, the Josie Montoya, Montoya Senior and Community Center. This annex parcel that is included in this active recreation calculation, that is what is in blue on your screen. So the rest of the regional park is outlined in green which leaves about 89 acres of passive recreation, which include items that we were just talking about, a pond, uh, outdoor classroom, and heavily forested areas. So the whole Thorpe Park Annex project, it was a large uh, community outreach and engagement process generated this concept. The process was robust, inclusive, with a lot of measurable data. I know we've talked about it a handful of times here at Commission over the course of greater than a year. Um, a recap for our City Council, because we had met on October 25th and November 15th, and this adoption had was in front of them on December 6th. So from those previous meetings, we, uh, the City Council really wanted to create a larger area for restoration, open spaces, uh, indigenous gardens, native plantings, a larger orchard around, and, and apologize for the acronym there, but the ICCC stands for the Indigenous Community Cultural Center, which is uh, this building right here in the center. That's the old historic stone building on the site. And an enhanced ceremonial space. So we accomplished that. and I'll. I'll post a larger version of this concept design when I get through this. Um, some other items that came up through those city council meetings were to relocate the six pickleball courts to not be within the boundaries of this Thorpe Park Annex, but rather relocate them over to where the current Thorpe Park Park is, which is look, uh, runs along North Thorpe Road. So I did include a note on this concept design, so that way we've got that there for um, if there's ever a day that we're not here. Um, adjust, we did some adjustments to parking based on the centerpiece of the Indigenous Community Cultural Center. And then for the time being, although this is what it did not end up being the result on December 6th, we were keeping the city employee housing, which are these blue blocks right here along Dale Avenue and Benito. So for the time being, when this was presented, that was on there. Here's just a, a, an Amy Hagen quick mapping job of relocating six pickleball courts to the current Thorpe Bark Park. Plus I added a, some additional parking there because that is a heavily parked area. That's also where park staff park throughout the day, seven days a week. Um, so that, that gave that image for city council. And then talked about a couple of the uh, concerns that were being brought forward by our fellow citizens. There were some concerns regarding increased traffic of park users entering this space. The points of entry are North Aztec Street, which a lot of our duck pond um, anglers take, and, and those wanting to go look at for, uh, with birds and other wildlife, as well as this parking lot that's over there. And then another entry point would be here up Dale and Mogion. There were concerns about this skate park and pump track with the proximity of this to um, both the Ruby Gardens, which is a lease space in on the parkland, as well as some of the houses that uh, the rear of their properties, off, um, their address, which is on Cherry Road. And there were some concerns with this city employee housing on parkland. I did demonstrate this for city council where these black dots, one of the black dots would be the uh, southern edge of the uh, bark park as well as this proposed skate park pump track and they had quite a distance to um, the rear of some of these homes along North Cherry Street just to demonstrate that as well as to the lease space of Ruby Gardens so that way we could talk about it with some uh, again measurable data with City Council that night. Show some images and what you know. What the heck is a skate park pump track? Because we don't have one anywhere in Flagstaff, and these are popping up in a lot of locations across the United States. Wanted to show a couple images of those. 
because it's not your typical skate bowls per se, but rather a little something different for all wheel devices. So went through that for city council. We went through some of these items on the city employee housing. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide because of the outcome of that night. And then just wanted to remind city council on what what is an adoption of a concept do for any of us um, it, it creates that path forward it's really this visual ideation of what we heard from the public so that way staff can plan they can budget we can design we can work through a design review process just like any other development that would occur within the city of Blackstaff, and eventually develop this and more than likely in phases, as we, as we talked about here at commission and multiple times at council, because there is no current identified funding for this entire process. So it will need to occur in phases. Then we went to questions. So let me share um, the most final version of this uh, concept design for the commission and then I can capture some of those results from that night on December 6th. And I can zoom in anywhere that anyone needs. So the, the, the blue rectangles, the city employee housing, that goes away. That will not be a part of this. Instead, I can will imagine that this will be more of the native revegetation gardens. That's the second colored green right here. So I would envision that here. Where the city employee housing is and we'll get a revised concept for this for ready for everyone so that way we all have this to refer to at a later date um, you know other changes or suggested changes were can we have some flexibility where this skate park and pump track is located again to that concern of the proximity to both ruby gardens and adjacent residences so a part of the adoption that night was to just re-examine where the location of this is. Is it a switch or a swap with the community gardens and orchard or, some, or somewhere else on this property to move it further north away from residences and where those 45 proposed parking stalls are? So those were the main results of that night. We were successful in getting this concept adopted which was a big success I think for the team working on this for quite some time and again it gives us that guidebook to start to plan in the future especially when uh, this commission we're discussing some of those priorities that we have the last couple commission meetings and for some future meetings any questions on Thorpe Park Annex in this concept Where did the where did the employee housing go? The employee housing has is basically gone. It will not be on this property. There is no other location for it. Gotcha. Sorry. <laughs> Do I see a hand up in the room? I, it's uh, the when the someone's sharing it. Yes, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Yeah, this was a great agenda. This is the first time I've attended one of your commission meetings in 40 years. But every every agenda <laughs> every agenda topic was like I got a comment right. about that. Um, so again, I live on Aztec Street, just south of the park. I was really happy as a citizen to see the new wear yard open and all of the trucks and tractors and everything now roll out from somewhere else instead of my driveway. Um, I responded to the survey. And I really appreciate the survey. Uh, I talked to uh, Councilman Shimoni about an idea before the survey came out. He thought it was worth mentioning. It wasn't one of the options listed. And uh, to get to my point, I'd spent uh, quite a few trips in, in over the years in Telluride, Colorado. Telluride, Colorado, if you've been there, has a, a pretty amazing parks and recreation plan that they updated in 2020, I believe. And there's a city park campground course, which I've stayed at many times, especially when I was a student and couldn't afford the crazy condominium rental prices there. We go there to all kinds of events. And I'd suggested in the survey, just writing it in, if it was possible to consider a moderately sized city managed tent only sort of camping ground. Uh, the central location of the park, of course, would allow, as I would perceive it, families to arrive, set up their camps, and then hike and bike pretty much in all directions using the foots 
and up into the Mesa and things like that. Was there ever any serious consideration about uh, a moderately sized campground, actually, like the one that's in Telluride? That's my question. Yeah, great, great question. It did not rise to the top. Um, I don't even know if he may have been the only individual to comment on that. I don't have all that data memorized, but there were well over a thousand responses to a lot of the outreach and it wasn't in a top 20. So I'm not sure how many individuals maybe um, had commented on that exactly. And thank you, Amy. And my point was it wasn't listed as even an option for people. So you had to kind of like well, think of it. Yeah. right? And, and believe it or not, around the time of the, of the survey, I actually had a chance to meet one of the Telluride council persons from the 1970s in Sedona. And I asked this gentleman, how did you folks ever get to the campground? Because I thought it might be controversial. But he said, oh, we just, it was just obvious. We needed a place for people who were visiting who wanted to camp out to stay. And uh, so that's why I brought it up, because it may, it may be too you know, impossible to think about it in the context of our park. But the central location of it and the need for some people who can't afford like the Airbnb costs for hotels in town, it's kind of like parallel to the uh, affordable housing question. If people want to visit and recreate here, but they have to stay somewhere. And if we had a central campground in the city, even if it was moderately sized, that might allow people access that they might not otherwise have. So, thank you. Absolutely. Any questions or anything from commissioners? I just want to say congratulations on a successful uh, uh, trip to the council and getting their feedback. Uh, we, when you presented it to us, you, we, there were questions on the employee housing, so it's not too surprising to see that that one got mixed. Um, it would be maybe good to have some additional parking spaces in that in that way. But uh, I appreciate the update, and uh, I open up for additional comments from other commissioners. Uh, Rowden, um, Stack House, uh, anybody have any other uh, comments? What's the next step or process with, from here on out now that council's approved? The Besides a deep breath. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Next step would be getting those uh, minor revisions done to this concept design. So at least that it's it's out there without, say, city employee housing or anything on there. Uh, and then I think it's to start uh, the, the planning process, strategic planning process on what funds do exist even if it's for some mitigation efforts on site, uh, there still is a temporary construction yard on site with Eagle Mountain Construction and I believe uh, phase one of Cocoa Estates. It's hoping that wraps up soon so we start to see more of what this site really entails as it looks out over onto the pond. Uh, and then I think it's working with um, the indigenous circle and that group and the nonprofit that they've established to start to figure out how do we tackle the ICCC and, and along with heritage preservation on that too. But I think it's, it really does, it gives us something um, tangible to start to work toward and, and work with this commission and others on priorities and a funding source for the future and in phases. And I, I think it will be delivered in phases too. Well, excellent work as always. Um, and Commissioner Rowden uh, uh, mentioned she doesn't have any questions under her end. So I think you're off the hook for now, Amy. Woo! <laughs> All right, uh, thank you very much. And moving on to City Council liaison reports. So uh, we did have Council Member Salas uh, on the meeting earlier, uh, but I think she had to hop off. Um, she is at the end of her tenure as a council member. So that's why, and actually I thought, um, I thought she was already done because <laughs> we said goodbye to the outgoing council members last Tuesday. And um, that's why the agenda does not have her name. The new council will be seated tomorrow and hopefully a new liaison will be assigned to the commission. And um, yeah, so stay posted, no report tonight. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we all got the uh, pros uh, year-end picture review, uh, which is great to see all the impact you've had to the communities. Um, 
the work you've done uh, in, in the field as well as with, with individuals. Uh, so thank you for saying that over. Uh, wonderful. Does anybody have any questions, thoughts, comments on the report that was reports that were submitted to us? Uh, another great year. Um, you guys do incredible work. Uh, I look forward to 23 uh, continuing building off of those successes and, and uh, just continue to do excellent stuff here for the city of Flagstaff. So yeah, great work all around. Thank you. Any, Thanks, uh, Ricky. Informational, <laughs> any informational items uh, to or from commissioners slash staff? Anything uh, to share? I'm trying to think if there's anything on my end. Did I no a play? That play's done. So uh, I, I'm back with you guys more on Mondays. Did I hear Commissioner Stackhouse try to jump in? Perhaps. Yeah, I, I just was saying thank you to Commissioner Conway. That was all. <laughs> oh. Well, I'm glad we didn't. Uh, I'm glad we didn't. Uh, I'm glad we paused for that one. I like to take all my kudos. Uh, <laughs> fills, up, fills up the old bucket, you know, that's good stuff. <laughs> uh, Staff, I don't think uh, we don't have updates for you, I don't believe, in the things we did. Other than I would, yes, so I would like to announce that um, we will have a new recreation manager beginning on January 9th. Wow, what a, what a day for the individual to begin and gets to come to uh, the January Commission meeting. It's Mr. Tyrone Johnson, who is currently our Recreation Supervisor at Hal Jensen Recreation Center and over at the Athletics Program. So we're super excited to add Tyrone in this role. Well, that's wonderful. And congratulations, Tyrone. I'll have to shoot him an email or uh, Facebook or something. That's, that's incredible news. Tyrone's been with the organization for a very long time. Um, I want to say he's one of the individuals that worked his way up through uh, through recreation, um, and I know uh, you know trained under Danny for many years, so he had a great mentor. So a uh, great fit and a wonderful person to move up into the organization. So Greg, congratulations to everybody involved. That's wonderful. And to tag onto that, and apologies that I tried to rush over that. Amy, thank you for stopping me. Um, as we fill this important role, which by the way, the recreation manager position has been vacant for more than a year and Amy was doing that work. So thank you, Amy. I'm sure she's super excited to get someone in that role. Um, we are also hopefully wrapping up recruitment for a parks manager to replace um, Amy in her previous role. Hopefully we'll be starting around the same time. And, um, we do plan on requesting that they attend these meetings and become more familiar with the commission and the work that you do and the work that they, and for you to be more familiar with the work that they do um, as we move forward. Well, that'll be great. Uh, introduce some new faces and we'd love to hear from other you know staff members too. If uh, during, you know, before an event, if Haley and others wanted to come to give us a presentation, we'd love to, We'd love to hear from everybody uh, at any point in time, Re Re Rebecca. So thank you for getting a new crop of people through uh, to come talk to us. I was really bummed I missed the winter lighting, the tree lighting. Um, I really wanted to go to that. That's one of my favorite events that you guys put on. Um, and I, it seemed like it was very successful, great pictures, uh, everything. Seemed to go really well for that winter wonderland event uh what yeah one of my favorites uh that you guys put on so i was really sad that i missed that but i was happy to see it was a very big success it was thank you for bringing that up chairperson conway it was a large success uh thank you to the events and marketing team of which beck thomas is a part of the hiding in the corner over here um but <laughs> it was is it, is it large well attended event. I, I know that the community enjoys it as well as any tourists for that weekend and for that evening and our downtown businesses definitely appreciate it. So huge success. And then the weekend after that, a, another event that we're still a part of in a more of a backseat way would be the holiday light parade since we do permit that and help assist with the roadway closure for that parade. And we also, this is our second year where we have staff going out there um, within the division 
many uh, paid volunteers to help block some of those intersections and support Flag Police Department on that. So we also were present for that event um, that Saturday afterwards. I think that was on the 10th. And then we do have a, another event with a similar capacity where we're a part of it, but still a little bit of a backseat with the um, fireworks and the pine cone drop on um, New Year's Eve. And That's right, yeah, pine cone drop's coming, wow. It is, it's coming. And Commissioner Stackhouse, I know you have to run, but that was that's another highlight maybe recently where we've been a part of. We have the first ever menorah display outside City Hall um, on the uh, what we would call the plaza on the south side. So check that out if you can, anybody. It's pretty neat. Yeah, just again, kudos to you, you guys, your staff have do, put on an amazing, uh, amazing scheduled events coming out of the pandemic, uh, growing and, and get, you know, increasing the uh, opportunities for people to recreate. Just everything you guys have done has been uh, amazing. I've really enjoyed my time here uh, working with you guys as the commissioner. So this has been uh, another great year and I look forward to 2023. Um, speaking of, can I just segue to any agenda items for January 2023 before we wrap up? Because I do have to run as well. Um, and it will be a meeting that I won't be able to be present for, but uh, if anybody has anything for that, you can say now or email um, Rebecca and company after this year meeting. But um, anything you want to discuss right now to be added to January? I know I have an item. It's a citizen driven. I have a citizen that's reached out would like to be on the agenda in January regarding uh, a consideration for a basketball court at Ponderosa Trails Park. So if we can fit that on the agenda, that would be great. Sure. That's that's the type of topic I'm used to having. <laughs> so, someone, someone coming looking for uh, looking for a new amenity, which uh, we're always happy to hear those out and see if we can work it into our long list of priorities. Um, so yeah, that'd be a great January discussion item. And I don't, I can't think of anything off the top of my head right now, but if I do have something, I will email, um, but I probably will wait to put on the February meeting since I will probably attend that one. All right, well, um, I think that's it. Unless there's anything else, I wanna wish you guys all a very happy holidays. Um, enjoy your time with your family and friends and loved ones, and uh, we will see you in the new year. Um, and thank you for all of your, service uh, for the com the community, the city of Flagstaff, uh, government, uh, municipalities. Uh, thank you for all that you do um, and hope you guys have a wonderful holiday. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>